James Bieland Rogers Jr. is an American investor and financial commentator based in Singapore. Rogers is president of Bieland Interests, Inc. He is the co-founder of Quantum Fund and Soros Fund Management. He was also the creator of the Rogers International Commodities Index. Listen to the full podcast to understand what's going on the global market, Ukraine war, and are we witnessing the beginning of de-dollarization? Please follow us on YouTube and open your notifications for further podcasts. Enjoy. Well, in, in terms of the outlook of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, they think that inflation globally will likely be tamed by next year when rate hikes start to work. Um, the IMF saying that global interest rates will keep rising until 2023 and then heated prices will begin to cool in response to actions from central banks. What's, do you agree? I, I've been investing a long time. I have never known the IMF to be fighting <laughs> about anything. I don't even bother. I mean, the best thing we could all do is abolish the IMF. We're not, because there are too many people who make money off the IMF. They've never been right about anything. Abolish the IMF, huh? Yeah, we'd be better off. That would be a, a way towards solving some of our problems. We abolish the IMF, the World Bank. Well, We'd be on the way. Why, why do you think that that would necessarily help solve some of the global you know economic how much money problems? We spend on the World Bank and the IMF every year huge amounts of money. All those guys that are bureaucrats at work, they love working for the IMF. They get tax free pensions, they get high, high salaries, they get all sorts of perks. They think it is heaven. Well, you know who's paying for it? Yeah. Us. Well, taxpayers in the U.S., global taxpayers, just to play devil's advocate here, don't we need uh, global bodies to coordinate things on the world stage? It would be wonderful if you can get a good one, do it. <laughs> the IMF ain't it. You great. should go back and read some of the IMF's annual report, some of the things they have said, and you would be stunned, stunned at how many times they said, Southeast Asia is great. And then the next year, there's a gigantic crisis in right. Southeast Asia. I could go on and on. Well, I know the IMF has taken a very aggressive position against Bitcoin. Certainly no fan of Bitcoin. And you have in the past said that you would have bought Bitcoin at a dollar or five dollars. That's, that's a quote from an interview you had um, with the Economic Times of India. Bitcoin, not quite that low, but is on sale, 70% down from its all-time high. Would you buy Bitcoin now? No, no, no. What I said was, I wish I had bought Bitcoin at a dollar or five dollars. Michelle, I wish I'd bought IBM in 1914. I wish I'd done a lot of things. I wish I'd bought Amazon at a dollar. No, no. All I said was, I wish. Okay. Well, you, you can't have it at a dollar or five dollars now. Well, that Hopefully not. Hopefully it doesn't drop to that level. But is there a level that you would buy Bitcoin at? There's no level at which I would buy those cryptocurrencies uh, unless something dramatic changes. No. The answer is no. What, what would be something dramatic? Well, I guess if suddenly the EU used the Bitcoin as its national uh, global currency, then you would have to. Then it's no longer cryptocurrency. It's a computer currency backed by governments. Bitcoin is wonderful for people who buy it and sell it and trade it. I know people who are having fun trading it. Nothing wrong with that. But if it ever becomes successful as currency, which they say it will, no government's going to allow that. Nobody, no government wants to lose its control. They all love their monopoly. They're not going to give up their monopoly. I wish they would, but they aren't. All right, not a fan of Bitcoin, but you've always been a fan of agriculture. And last time you were on the show, you said that a good inflation hedge was uh, the Rogers uh, Agricultural Index. It did perform well. It did drop over the last month or so, still up about 2% year to date. Why are we seeing a sell up in agriculture now? Sure, nothing goes straight up or straight down. Things go up like this. There are always corrections along the way. And maybe there's something else going on, but in my experience, corrections are normal and common. They happen all the time. So is investing in agriculture still a wise move if you're trying to hedge it against this my current plan, inflation? My answer is yes, but my plan is if there's peace in Ukraine, 
agriculture is going to go down. All grain prices are going to go down for a while, and that's the time to buy. What is the likelihood of peace in, in Ukraine over the next year or so? If you were to prognosticate how this plays out. Well, I would say the, the chances are very good. It's a foolish war. All wars are foolish, but I mean, Mr. Biden's not getting, Mr. Putin's not getting anything out of it. The Ukraine's aren't getting anything out of it. I don't see that it's doing anybody any good. Uh, and Mr. Biden, uh, Mr. Putin may get what he wants, or at least part of what he wants, and then things would calm down. But listen, I don't have any inside right, information right. But, but on- you're a man, a seasoned man of the world with insights across the globe, so always like to get your thoughts on things. I would suspect that there will be some positive development in Ukraine in the next few weeks, yes, if not before. Wow, in the next few weeks, and that would trigger a relief rally. That would trigger a drop, big drop in grains, a big drop in oil, which would cause a big relief rally in stocks because everybody would say inflation's okay now, no more problems, hooray, buy stocks, buy bonds. What do you think a diplomatic solution to this war could look like? Would that involve territorial concessions to Russia? Would it involve Ukraine declaring that it won't join NATO? What do you think that would look like? Those questions are complicated because Ukraine, you know, is not a real country. It's something that the Soviet, all of those guys were part of the Soviet Union before. And Stalin or somebody said, okay, these are the Ukraine and this is Russia, et cetera. <coughs> parts of what is now Ukraine were really parts of Russia before. And then somebody, when they were drunk or lost or confused, said, okay, you're in Ukraine now and this is Russia, et cetera. So if you're talking about territorial concessions, if the previous Russian parts of Ukraine went back to Russia, is that a territorial concession? That's what the Ukrainians would say. But is it in the big scheme of history? Probably not. And that's obviously a matter of perspective and a valid one at that. Would you say, though, that that is how this conflict gets resolved, if you were to speculate? Well, we certainly have to do something. As I said, it's a foolish war. It's costing a lot of people a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and lives, of course. So somebody's got to figure out whatever we have to do, let's solve this problem. And that may be a solution. I have no idea what it'll take. You know, maybe if we all drop billions of dollars into Ukraine, that would solve the problem. Something needs to be done. In the meantime, we do have this war creating a stronger relationship between Russia and China. And it has led to a discussion of the potential bifurcation of the global monetary system with perhaps some kind of commodity-backed central bank digital currency that is used by China, Russia, some of the BRIC countries. You have prognosticated about the ultimate collapse of the dollar as a sole global reserve currency. Has this war accelerated that? Yes, unfortunately, the war has accelerated. You know, the world's international medium of exchange is supposed to be neutral. You can do any, anybody can do anything with it they want to. But unfortunately, Washington is changing those rules. Washington says, well, if we don't like you, you cannot use the U.S. dollar. And people say, wait a minute. An international medium of exchange is supposed to be neutral. That's not the way it's supposed to work. So for many reasons, many countries are now looking, even our allies are now looking for something to compete because it could happen to them. You know, all of a sudden Washington could say, you're finished. So for political reasons, it's accelerating the move to looking for a competitor to the dollar. And of course, the economic reason. We're the largest debtor nation in world history. I'm not the only person who knows that. The whole world knows that historically, Big currencies, major top currencies change every hundred years or so. So for political and economic reasons, it's already in process. And this may make it worse because Washington has said, we'll take your money away from you if we don't like you. Many people have had their assets seized by the U.S. because they don't like them now. 